Greetings, everyone. I am Rick Torres, President and CEO of the National Student Clearinghouse. Sorry I cannot be there in person today. Our nonprofit mission of service to the education community over the past years has been in part about uniquely presenting the evolving national enrollment landscape. We accompanied those presentations and publications with enabling further research by institutions, education organizations, and grantees of foundations who are committed to understanding how to best drive improvements in access, persistence, and completion rates of credential-seeking learners. Leveraging higher education's capacity to educate, train, develop, and better prepare learners for the next step in their journey. Today's focus is the issue and the opportunity of a growing number of some college and no credential learners. I'd like to thank the Lumina Foundation and Dr. Courtney Brown for their persistent support of initiatives that are designed to improve the number of adults with quality higher education credentials. Thank you for your support of this research. The impact of COVID on education has really been a story of two tales. One is a narrative of how quickly the education and workforce landscapes are evolving in light of skilled labor shortages accompanied by significant enrollment declines in certain age groups and the disparate impact on low-income and minority populations. The other is the actual tale of the impact on the pandemic on traditional pipelines. Those effects may be longer lasting than the life of the pandemic itself. The tale of the pandemic story is still unfolding. There has been extraordinary pressures on higher education. Enrollment declines, rising tuition costs, a lot of questioning of the role and the value of higher education, and a large focus on ensuring equity in education. These pressures and areas of focus were greatly exacerbated and brought into focus by the pandemic. And yet, along with these pressures, there's an opportunity to affect a transformational change in the narrative and reset the trajectory of learners and enrollment declines. The convergence of workforce labor shortages and the emerging recognition of skill-based learning and training, much of which higher education is and can be positioned to provide, is one of the many impactful opportunities for institutions to consider. This can help drive additional re-engagement of students who have stopped out of their higher education journey without completing any credential. I know that institutions today are very actively looking at this learner population and strategizing on enabling opportunities. Today's report will update the size and scope of this opportunity, keeping in mind that in 2019, the total number of some college no credential learners was 36 million. I wanna thank Dr. Doug Shapiro and Dr. McKeung Ru and our fantastic Clearinghouse Publications team for their terrific work. We are looking forward to establishing this as an annual report that can lead to action on the part of education to strategically and purposefully re-engage with learners, especially as the apertures are opening to new opportunities. NSC will be there to support institutions directly as they engage with this report and choose to take action through existing services such as Student Tracker and our new services under development such as the Clearinghouse Completion Network. And now I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Doug Shapiro, who will be providing a high-level view of the results. Hello, my name is Miguel Liu, Director of Research Publications at the Research Center. Due to last minute change, I'm going to speak in Doug Shapiro's place to present a high level overview of some college no credential population updates and the subsequent student outcomes during the past academic years. So in July, 2020, several months after the pandemic started, the sum college no credential population in short SCNC has reached over 39 million. This is an increase of 3.1 million from nearly 36 million SCNC population we previously reported in 2019. This increase was explained by a combination of net growth of 1.9 million and the methodological changes that additionally identified 1.2 million SCNC population. These changes included two additional populations, 
SSC students in the U.S. territories or those who had all individual identifiers reported to student clearinghouse except one. But without these method changes, we found that 48 states and District of Columbia had a net growth in SSNC population. Looking at SSNC population age profile, the 39 million SSNC students are middle-aged adults with a median age over 40 years old. As the SSNC population is increasingly aging, it is important to note that the number of people who had a more recent enrollment, that is 10 years or less since stepping out, decreased with age, falling significantly for those older than age 34. This age threshold appears to be an important factor because two thirds of the re enrolled SSNC students in the past academic year were adults under age 35. We also found similar age patterns leading to greater student outcomes in the previous reports. Likewise, by looking at the prevalence of younger adults within SSNC population, we can assess the scale of opportunity that the SSCNC population represents for state efforts to raise the level of post-secondary education attainment in the state. We define student states by the location of their institution of last enrollment, not necessarily their state of residence. As you see on this map, states vary in the number of SSCNC students and they are largely proportional to their overall higher education enrollment sizes. For example, over a third of the SSNC population nationwide attended and stopped out of college located in large states such as California, Texas, New York, and Illinois combined. However, interesting state variation appears in which some states are notable for having a relatively large SSCNC population per 1,000 currently enrolled undergraduates and a disproportionately large number of them falling under age 35 within that population. So compared to the national average where there are over 2,100 SSCNC students for every 1,000 currently enrolled undergraduates. In Alaska, SSCN student population is nearly five times greater than currently enrolled undergraduate population in the state, to be exact, over 4,900 students. And importantly, 43.9% of their SSCN population falling under age 34. Based on this result, relative to other states, we can say Alaska has perhaps one of the highest levels of untapped SCNC population that states can leverage to improve the post-secondary attainment rate. Students of color are overrepresented among the SSNC population particularly Black, Latinx, and Native American learners relative to their shares of currently enrolled undergraduate students. Black and Latinx students combined represent 42.8%, about 8.5 percentage point higher compared to about 34% overall among undergraduates. Black students are particularly overrepresented at 19.6% of SSNC population compared to slightly less than 14% of overall undergraduate population. And Latinx students and Native Americans show a similar overrepresentation among SSNC population. The only exceptions are Asian students and white students that are uh, less 
represented in among assassins population. It's worth noting that race and ethnicity data has limited coverage in, in the early years of clearinghouse data collection. So these race ethnicity results were based on a sample of SSC students who began college in more recent years, to be exact in 2013 or later, accounting for 7.2 million students. This year's report presented the opportunity to examine the annual progress in terms of the subsequent enrollment and completion outcomes through three new metrics. In the annual reporting, student outcomes are not fully assessed and represent partial results, but we will continue to track these results next year to paint a more complete picture. So here are the results for the past academic year, 2020-2021. Despite the COVID-19-led disruptions, over 944,000 students came back and re-enrolled in post-secondary education, and more than 60,000 students attained the credential the same year they returned. This includes over 18,000 students or 31% of the all new graduate who were bachelor's degree recipients. An additional 532,000 students were still enrolled after re-enrolling the previous year. All of these outcomes reference SCNC population aged 18 to 64. It's worth noting that to calculate the perseverance rate, we tracked SSCNC students over a two-year period, and we found pretty high the combined success and progress rate of 61.1% among 2019-2020 academic year re-enrollees. That includes those who persevere in the following year, or who complete a credential the same year they re-enroll. So all of these findings are really reinforcing the same findings we reported in past years. Once SSCNC students re-enroll, they are likely to persist until they complete a first credential without stopping out again. And most of them obtain a credential at the institution where they re-enrolled. The typical gender disparities in higher education continue with SSCNC students. Women SSCNC students outnumber their male counterparts in all three metrics. This is despite the fact that in the overall SSCNC population, there are only slightly more women than men. The chart on the left shows women's re-enrollment rate is 1.5 times higher than the rate among men within the same age groups under 35. The gender gap narrows among older students. Notably, the gender disparities are more pronounced among students of color. Women made up almost two thirds of all re enrollees who are students of color. On the other hand, in the chart on the right, associate degrees and sub-baccalaureate certificates are the most common credentials attained by SSNC students, accounting for about 69% of annual total awards. This is in notable contrast to the national patterns of first-time college graduates generally, who are more likely to earn bachelor's degrees. In terms of race and ethnicity, 42.5% of Latinx students earned associate degrees last year, the largest associate degree share of any race ethnic group, whereas the same percentage of Black students complete a certificate. Bachelor's degree attainment is most common for Asian students, although their numbers are relatively small. 
So as we continue tracking student outcomes for a longer period, completion rates are expected to increase generally. But I think the gender disparities or the common types of credentials students pursued across racial ethnic lines are unlikely to change quickly or drastically. Finally, I mainly focused on national level findings in this overview, but more detailed outcomes data are available for all 50 states in District of Columbia in the national state dashboard and data appendices available from the Research Center website. And now I would like to hand it over to today's moderator, Courtney Brown from Lumina Foundation. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much, Mick Young, for providing this updated information on such an important uh, population. As Mick Young said, I am Courtney Brown, uh, and I am the Vice President of Strategic Impact and Planning at Lumina Foundation. I appreciate uh, this great publication, but I've got to say it's shocking to me. We are now close to 39 million adults in the U.S. who started college and, for whatever reason, had to stop out before completing a credential. And that's one in four adults, uh, which is uh, still uh, overwhelming when I think about it. And while I'm sad to see that number going in the wrong direction and impacting so many lives and so many communities, I'm really thankful to the Clearinghouse, to your team, Mick Young, that you've now committed to providing data on the pathways these individuals take back into and through a post-secondary credential. It's the pathway that I wanna dig into a little today. Um, together, we all need to find solutions and pathways for millions of these individuals to re-enter and successfully complete a high quality credential. So for our panel today, I'm joined by three individuals who have been focused on this population and are working to understand what returning adults need to be successful and how their institutions can actually deliver on that. So let me do some, some quick introductions here. Uh, first of all, I'm joined by uh, Dr. Patricia Steele. Dr. Steele is the principal and founder of Higher Ed Insight, a research and strategy firm that works with student success leaders in higher ed, nonprofits, and philanthropy. The Higher Ed Insight team is committed to advancing racial equity and justice by increasing opportunities in education and the workforce for marginalized groups. Next, I have Dr. Patricia Urjavik, and she's beginning her 13th year as president of Pueblo Community College in Colorado, a Hispanic-serving institution. So under Patty's leadership, PCC has embarked upon several innovative approaches to student success that has led to increased enrollment, retention, and completion. A move from developmental education to supplemental instruction, guided pathways, the addition of six Bachelor of Applied Science degrees, and a fleet of Bellwether Award Mobile Learning Labs are just a few of the nationally recognized initiative making PCC a true student-centric institution. And finally, uh, Nick Vaught. So Nick serves as the Assistant Dean for Academics and Student Success in the College of Interdisciplinary and Continuing Studies at Morgan State University, a historically Black university. Mr. Vaught is committed to expanding access to post-secondary education for all students and ensuring that adult learners receive individualized support to help them accomplish the goal of finishing their degree. So thank you all for joining us. Before we begin, I want to remind all of you listening that at the end of our discussion, we're going to open it up to your questions. So please feel free to enter questions at any point in the Q&A section. The questions can be for one of our panelists or they can be for Mick Young, who will rejoin us at the end of the conversation. So first of all, Patricia, let me start with you. Your team recently published a report on some college no credential students who successfully re-enrolled and completed a credential. Tell us a little bit about the study and about your top findings. Sure, uh, thank you so much, Courtney. So the group that we looked at, we tried to identify um, those who were successful and institutions that were enrolling a large number of these folks. We also limited our sample to institutions where the clearinghouse was gathering email addresses because of course we wanted to conduct a survey. 
Uh, so, but there were a few really interesting things that we learned from this group. Um, so, given that this group re enrolled successfully in 2018 and they were still, they were still enrolled or had completed a degree. So, that's the population that we wanted to find and identify. We surveyed about 1400 of these folks. And what we learned that was really fascinating, given the fact that this population had re-enrolled in 2018 and we surveyed them a few years later in June of 2021, so last year. What was fascinating to me was their incredible success. A large portion of these folks had not only completed credentials, they'd also completed more than one credential in some cases. Uh, we also found that um, you know, among this group, and, and also I should just say that of this group, there were four community colleges, a private nonprofit, and then some private nonprofit, three not private nonprofits that were online institutions. So we definitely have a disproportionate group of those who are online, um, but they were incredibly successful. And I think this is unexpected because many people look at this population and they, and they see stopouts or dropouts. When in reality, what we, what we heard in the survey and what we heard in the qualitative responses is that this was really a story about perseverance for these students, not persistence. They didn't look at themselves as though they were people who had stopped out, but instead they identified as folks who were getting ready for a time when they could re-enroll. So it was, you know, college was fitting in between life for them. So they had other commitments, jobs, families, um, it, it, it just took time. So I think the quick learning, maybe one or two quick learnings from it are, I, I really think we have to extend the time frame that we give students to succeed when we think about outcomes, that's number one. Uh, I think we also have to really think radically about how to make the process easier for students. I think that is really where the conversation has to begin for not just institutions, for employers, and for those who run particularly our state financial aid programs, and even how we think about it from a federal policy perspective. Thank you so much. Um, Nick, let me turn to you next. Uh, at Morgan State, uh, you know, a prestigious HBCU, we don't see a lot of this um, at many prestigious institutions, a lot of focus on the some college no credential uh, population. But you guys have actually implemented a new program that focuses on this population. Tell us a little bit more about what you're doing. Yeah, this is a really interesting history. And so about five years ago, we launched a program at Morgan called the Applied Liberal Studies Program. So this was a new interdisciplinary studies program that really geared for non-traditional students and to, to help them come back to school and earn their degree. That program took off, and in just a few short years, we're about to graduate our 400th student this spring. So we're really excited about that. So we knew that that program was helping students, and so we wanted to replicate the success. And so we uh, got a team together and devised 18 degree programs. So 10 undergraduate degree, uh, eight undergraduate degree programs, and then even five masters and five PhD for folks who've stopped out, no matter if you're an undergraduate or a graduate student, geared at this adult learner. And I think what's really unique about the programs we designed are that they're interdisciplinary, they're meet, meeting some high needs within the employment industry, and that they're not necessarily modifications of currently existing programs. So we're not taking a traditionally face-to-face -face program and trying to find a way to accelerate it so an adult learner can do it. We're building a new program whole hog. And we're doing this by accepting a really a maximum amount of transfer credits coming in, doing some credit for prior learning, credit for professional service uh, and experience. And we're doing all this because our goal is to help students finish their degree and not really start over. Um, this incredibly quickly. So the creation of this new college, the College of Interdisciplinary and Continuing Studies, uh, is this whirlwind. Um, last June, we submitted the plan to the state of Maryland, and then by November, we had a new college, and then in January, we enrolled our first 12 students. Uh, and so it's happened incredibly fast, and we're actually on pace to enroll 200 students 
this fall. Um, and so I think that the story of this college isn't kind of the revision of what's existing, but the creation of new programs specifically geared for this some college new credential population. Thank you, Nick. That's really interesting, especially your, your partnership in getting it approved by the state so, so quickly so you can actually impact so many students. So thank you. So Patty, um, you actually started a return to earn program at Pueblo. Tell us how that got started and, and how it's going. The um, data that was just presented to us really is the PCC story. And um, our, my particular service area, we're from Colorado. So my particular service area is not really urban, but it's not really rural. And um, we are seeing declining uh, in population and declining uh, enrollment in our high schools. And so the question is, where are we going to get our students and how are we going to continue to fill the skills gap uh, in the communities that we serve? So I asked the question, how many students have been enrolled at Pueblo Community College that never completed? And uh, I was given a list of 6,000 students. Now keep in mind, on average, each year we serve about 8,000 students. So that was quite a, uh, quite a surprise. And so obviously we, we, we didn't believe that we were going to be able to re-engage all 6,000 students. So we really did look at those students that had been um, away from us for a year or two. We started with them. We started uh, looking at the number of credits that they had already completed successfully. And so we pared it down to those students that had already earned 30 to 45 credits and left the college with uh, debt less than $500. So that was what we did. We, we pulled it down and then we reached out to those students individually and gave them a personal invitation to re-enroll and to come back to us. And that if they completed a semester successfully, we would uh, pay off their debt, which then would allow them to be financial aid uh, eligible again and allow them to succeed. And so uh, that was met with a lot of enthusiasm, but we didn't stop there. We knew that if we were going to really get these students across the uh, finish line, we needed to pay attention to what, what were the uh, reasons that they dropped out to begin with. And so those wraparound services uh, became extremely important. That one-on-one -on -one unique um, attention to each student is what we believe uh, helped really build the program to where it is. Uh, since 2016, we have served 532 students, uh, and 92% of them did pass that first se semester, um, so we were able to get them across the finish line. And so our success rate with this program is 80, actually 87%, keeping in mind that our, our graduation rate is well below that um, overall for the college. So um, we know that serving the unique student is extremely important. We know that personal attention and that being able to offer them all of those services, all those things that life happens gets in the way that caused them to drop out, help them uh, so that there are no excuses for them to continue to complete. Thank you. Patty, I wanna, I wanna keep on that uh, theme a little bit, because you know one of the things that we know we need to do if there are 39 million um, students out there, I guess another million who have re-enrolled and are working toward completion, but it's a lot of students out there and, and we need to find new ways to bring them back. So a postcard no longer works. So you talked about some individualized phone calls you made or, or outreach that you made. What are some things that really successfully worked at Pueblo to get, to get students to come back? Do you think it was that, that financial aid incentive or there's something else that, that you think helped to get them back? Well, I think that first phone call was very important uh, for, for individuals to think that we cared enough about them to reach out 
And the question wasn't, um, the first question wasn't, are you coming back to college? But the question is, we notice you're gone. Is everything okay? Is there anything we can do for you as an institution to help you? So, um, of course, we wanted them to come back. But really developing uh, a genuine relationship is extremely important. And I think then uh, word of mouth, uh, when, when students uh, found out that they really could come back and continue and get that degree, then they would tell other students. Uh, we did a lot of targeted social um, media campaigns where, again, uh, student, you could see the, uh, the chatter. Um, hey, did you see this was going on? You need to check it out. So a lot of one-on-one, -on -one targeted, uh, reaching out to our students, I think, is what made the difference. Excellent. Nick, how about you? How did you reach out to the people who have stopped out of college? And what do you find is, is really working to get those, you said 400 or re-enrolling in the fall? What do you think has been the secret to that? Yeah, uh, I'm going to echo what Patty said. So first off, we partnered with our own Office of Institutional Research to identify students who had stopped out of Morgan State. So they are our students um, since 2006 uh, and met the credentials and the criteria for our program. So our undergraduate uh, students have to come into our new programs with at least 60 credit hours. So they're in some ways near completers. And so we're able to, uh, we were able to identify about 4,500 students who have 60 credit hours or an academic good standing, but stopped out and never finished their degree here at Morgan. And we started uh, individually reaching out to all of those students and sending them varied messages. And I think it really made a, a big difference when it was a person's name behind in a per, in an individual's email behind that outreach and not a entity, not the you know College of Interdisciplinary and Continuing Studies Admissions Office, right? It was Emma is reaching out. And I think that drew a lot of conversation with the students and actually pushed more students to have, have a conversation about tell me more about this program and then submit an application. So we, we first targeted our undergraduate population and because our, we have graduate degrees as well, We've identified about 500 students, 500 potential students who meet our criteria, uh, who came to Morgan State, earned a significant amount of graduate credit, but never finished their graduate degree. So we're reaching out to them as well. I think the final piece is we, we have partnered with uh, EAB to reach out and to do some recruitment for us, as well as becoming an Amazon Career Choice Partner Institution, where folks who work for Amazon can use their um, tuition uh, reimbursement and tuition waivers uh, to come to Morgan and finish up their degree. I think that's going to expand our pool of students as well. Excellent. Patricia, how about uh, you, based on your research uh, on, on those who successfully re-enrolled and completed, what other ways should institutions consider implementing? One important piece is messaging. Uh, we did find that it was extensive how much work-related reasons drove people's decision to return. So that connection between their learning programs and their career trajectory. Uh, another was really a personal motivation. So that internal drive is an important piece. Um, and, and individual, the survey respondents really focused a lot on processes. So being able to access an advisor in appropriate hours, being able to see visually a clear map uh, or a plan to their degree completion, um, having those distinct connections between their studies uh, and their career opportunity was also really valuable. And then, you know, access to everything that a student needs to be supported, being available at the time that they need, that they need it, or for that matter, having uh, assignments, you know, flow in such a way where, you know, you have a weekend to get it done and you're not turning in two or three assignments on a weekday. Uh, those were some of the big things that we really heard. A lot of it was around logistics and the desire for more online hybrid options, more frequency of availability of courses, accelerated degree programs, as well as just the time of day that classes are offered. Right. Any other comments on this before we move on? I absolutely agree that everything that 
Patricia just articulated is, is spot on. And I remember um, a, a young mother, single mother coming to college and she really wanted to complete her degree. Single mother, working part-time, had three children. She signs up for a philosophy class. We had a wonderful new young professor who immediately on the first day gave uh, like a six page reading, a, a six chapter reading assignment with uh, some report due the next time class uh, uh, was in session. What do you think that that mother did? Dropped out. Yeah. You know, absolutely. Uh, and she came and I just happened to run into her and she was in tears. She said, I can't do this. And so, you know, that I thought was just so profound is we have to make sure that our, our faculty, that our staff are also um, well aware of what it's going to take to help our students get across the finish line. But uh, I'll never forget that young woman. Hopefully, we were able to help that professor realize that that sort of uh, workload um, was not going to um, get that student across the finish line. It's a really great example. I mean, it makes us realize how we need to be student-centered and understand who our students are and the challenges that they're facing across the board. Excellent. So uh, before I ask my uh, my last question, I just want to remind all of you listening to please put your questions in the chat. They're already coming in. Um, I can see them, and we're going to get through as many as, as we are able to. But go ahead and start entering those at, at any point. So as Mick Young pointed out, the some college no credential population is disproportionate to students of color. We've got to find better solutions to support Black, Hispanic, and Native students through completion. So I really want to talk about this a little bit more. And Nick, you know, as an HBCU, how does Morgan State really think about this issue? And what strategies have you found that, that better support Black students or, or any student of color? Yeah. I think uh, supporting students of color is our core mission as an HBCU, right? Um, so students come to HBCUs for that individualized support. So whether they're walking through a physical door or a virtual door, they're doing classes online, they're kind of expecting to have someone they can be in contact with and not just a general office. Uh, so that kind of individualized support where a student really feels like they are seen, that they're understood, is really what gets students through the doors, at least at Morgan. One of our great alums, uh, April Ryan, has always said that HBCUs love you to success. And that's really what we're trying to model in the College of Interdisciplinary and Continuing Studies. So from the first time students contact us, they're put in contact with a person, not an entity or an office. And this is is really kind of the heart of what we're striving to do. We've all talked about how advisement is key, having a single person of contact is key, and, and I think that's also the key for you know adult learner retention, right? Um, that you know we're making our advisors have extremely small caseloads, and what results from that is that they get to know the students they're working with. That they're not just academic advisors who can give a clear program plan, but they can talk to students, be a support for students, even be an emotional support at time for students, um, because they know that their students are, you know, juggling caring for folks at home, both parents and children, and, and caring, you know, being part of religious communities and community organizations, juggling multiple jobs. And so when an advisor knows this and kind of knows that individual detail about their students, they're able to support them and be that primary resource. So, you know, from even though a lot of adult learners, some, you know, persist to getting their degrees, when a student stops out, we uh, have really taken and created the habit of always reaching out to the student. So reaching out multiple times throughout the fall or spring. How are you doing? How's it going? How are your kids? And I think that re-engages the students and gets them back enrolled with the institution. Um, so I think really at the core of this is advising, right? And having that not only support, but caring for each student. And I think that's, you know, why students come to HBCUs. I think that's also 
what's going to lead towards greater numbers of students enrolling in programs like ours where they have someone to talk to, someone who is on their side throughout their entire matriculation process. Thanks, I love that phrase, HBCUs love you to success. Wouldn't it be great if we could say that of all institutions, love you to success, um, hopefully in the future. So uh, Patricia, let me turn to you. Uh, what did you learn in your research? Anything specific about what students of colors value and what they need? I think the important thing that we noted was that, especially through the qualitative responses in our survey, um, that Latinx and Black students, uh, we had fewer of Native American students, but I think that that each was very different, that there were different drivers for what facilitated their return and success, and that were different challenges. And so I think what that means is there you can't apply a, a blanket approach, that there are really unique needs. Um, one example is uh, Black learners talked a lot about the importance of their personal goals in their return, so and, and, and really talked a lot about having a lot of personal supports. And so thinking about ways to encourage that and support that. Uh, whereas with Latinx learners, there was a lot more emphasis on college costs and the barriers to complexity and enrollment. Uh, so there are different things to address there. Uh, but we also just in general wanted to stress that, um, you know, it's not a one size fits all for each of these populations. Yeah. And I'd Absolutely. love to, by the way, I shared with the host the link to our report. I neglected to do that. So please feel free to share it with the group. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's a great report. Patty, so as a uh, HSI, Hispanic Serving Institution, tell us a little bit about how you think about ser better serving uh, Hispanic students. So uh, I think that for us, when we take a look at our TRIO programs, that's what we want to model our entire college after. Our, we have about 60% of our students are first generation students, and then about 35% of our students are Hispanic. So when a student enrolls and on that first day, they get their syllabi and they get all of the expectations laid out and they go home at night and they say, do you know what this thing called a syllabi is? And do you know what I'm supposed to do here next? Who's going to help them? There isn't anyone at home to help them. So it really is imperative that we're the ones that take the time to understand each unique student's circumstances. And our TRIO programs are terribly successful because they have all of those success coaches and all those resources available to them. So what we're really trying to do is model our entire college as if it were a TRIO college where there are success coaches and the faculty and the advisors and the president. There isn't anybody at the institution that doesn't make themselves available to our students so that they can get the resources that they need and feel comfortable and don't feel like um, they're, they're unique. They are unique, but we don't want them to feel like um, they don't have what it takes to be successful. Excellent. Thank you. All right, I'm already getting nervous because we're running out of time and we have so many questions that have come through. So I want to make sure that we get to some of the, um, the audience questions. So Patricia, I'm going to start with you. Um, well, our first question is, do you know how many students that re-enrolled were able to access Pell Grants? And relatedly, how did they pay for college? Yeah, the majority of the folks were borrowing, but there were also a large portion of them who had some grants. So we don't have all the detail on exactly what they were. We had an unusually high percentage, up to 25% who had employer aid. So that is definitely an anomaly. Um, it could be in part because we had a number of veterans present in the population because of the online programs. But uh, there is potential for exploring that a bit further to find out what kinds of employer aid and how were they administered and how did that support your, uh, your trajectory? Because clearly when you get the aid and how much and whether it covers books and expenses has big, big implications on how helpful it is to you uh, completing. 
may ask a related question to, to Patty and Nick from, from the audience. So, you know, Patty, you talked a lot about the debt it's successfully completed. Uh, that's a pretty amazing offer that you have. Uh, and you both talked about non-financial uh, aspects of it, advising and, and, and helping and, and providing information for students. Do you think non-financial factors are as important as financial factors when re-enrolling pop this population? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you, I know, again, when so much of our population is Pell eligible, I, I honestly don't think that finance is as big of a factor as making sure that our students have um, daycare, that they have affordable housing so that they're not having to deal with that, that their food insecurities are being met, that they have proper transportation. So um, there is, um, at least in my uh, college, we have tremendous partnerships with our community to make sure that scholarships are available for our students. Uh, but it doesn't matter. If you have the money and you enroll, if you can't persist, what good does that do? And then you only end up with another barrier in that um, you have, you'll have a debt to pay off that, um, how are you going to do that? Great. Is anything you want to add? Yeah, exactly. So I, I do think that you know, the non-financial pieces uh, really inspire right, the student to come back knowing that they have that support. But the finances are important. So one thing that we've done, which I think is incredibly unique, is we have uh, reduced residency. Um, so we are counting every student essentially as in-state, uh, no matter if they are in-state or out-of-state, and reducing the, our tuition and fees for this college, uh, you know, exclusively for this college. So you know, essentially, no matter where you are in the United States, you can come to us and finish up your degree uh, and it'll be a very low rate, you know, as compared to, you know, a lot of other institutions uh, gearing up. And we view this as a, a, a mission of justice, right, of that these students who have some college and no degree are overwhelmingly burdened with student debt already. Why increase it even more? Thank you. Um, so for, for Patty or Nick, have you noticed a difference? young adults who left after enrolling compared to older adults? And if so, are there noticeable differences between the two groups? That's a really good question. I, Go ahead, Patty. I, I'm not sure that there is a difference. Um, it really uh, matters what the, um, what the pathway was for the student and um, what their unique circumstances were. But I, I think that our success rate has been equal for all the students. Yeah, uh, I, I haven't noticed any really tangible difference in how these students, um, whether they stop out and come back when they're in their younger 20s versus you know, uh, more adult. I think they come back with the same kind of intrinsic motivation that we see from a lot of adult learners returning to school. Anything you want to add, Patricia? Uh, no, I mean, certainly this isn't something we focused on in this particular study, but I, I do recall from some of our past work that this population was really coming with a real heavy load of financial challenges or debts or complexity in figuring out you know, lost credit hours or how to access um, their past higher ed experience in order to be successful in the current one. Thank you. So, Patty and Nick, both of you, a lot of your, your focus has been on students who left your institutions and re-enrolling those students. But if you're thinking about other students, and, and maybe you have some of that also, how do you handle students who don't have transcripts or have some sort of transcript hold from other institutions? Have either of you had to deal with that? Well, as a community college, obviously we focus in our own community and with our own students. So that really hasn't been um, a, an issue for us to address. Obviously with 6,000 students, we have plenty of uh, students to work with and we haven't had to move outside to a different target. 
Yeah. Um, I think the barrier for admission into our program, because we are really a degree completion program, that students have to show that they have 60 credit hours in order to get admission into our uh, programs, um, prohibits you know students who would not have their transcripts available due to financial reasons, unfortunately. Um, we haven't explored how to move beyond that because right now we are still in the launching phase and, and still um, bringing in students who uh, quite easily can get their transcripts. I will say that of our 12 currently enrolled students, only one student of the 12 had previously attended Morgan State. Um, and so I think that's a interesting data point that folks are um, looking at other institutions um, to return to. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you for that. So let me ask uh, one more audience question before we have to start to, to wrap it up. Um, and this could be really for any, but I'm going to I'm gonna start with you because you mentioned employers. How do you think employers can help this population of students? Uh, I think the way most employer programs are structured is you get paid back uh, after you've completed. So it just right there, it's a it's difficult for some people to have the credit to uh, the liquidity to put that money up front. Uh, or sometimes it just covers something limited like tuition, whereas we know in some programs, the cost of books and fees are exceedingly high. Um, so it's there's not necessarily enough. We also. Uh, I think from other research that there are some successful approaches where employers have cohorts of employees go through programs together. And so that's another area we're quite interested in, you know, maybe seeing some more structured partnerships, like what Nick mentioned with Amazon, uh, where you're working with a specific employer. That's a partic particular example because it's a very large employer. But local employment relationships, especially between community colleges, uh, who want to retrain their workforce, uh, structuring some product programs where they can put cohorts of students through them together as a potential successful approach. Patty, do you work with any employers uh, in your community? Oh, we work with every single employer in our community. And, um, you know, you had mentioned the, the generous approach to helping students pay off their debt. That's because we have a lot of employers who are providing us with scholarship dollars to um, help those students. It's a great return on investment for them. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So before we wrap up, I'd like to ask each of you um, for one piece of advice, though not a really long piece of advice, a quick piece of advice that you might give your peers in providing better opportunities for these 39 million, some college no, uh, credential individuals, to help them to enroll and successfully complete a credential? What's something that you want your peers to do? Uh, I'll go first. This is not from our report, but it has to do with this issue of transcripts and the really important consumer protection issue there for folks who have paid for credits, but they can't get access to them in order to move on in their academic lives. Uh, they've paid for them, they received, they took the classes, they got the credits, but because they owe a small amount of money or even a large amount of money for a final term, it's sort of held hostage for life. Uh, so I think all institutions in particular need to rethink this, and I'm very pleased to see that at the federal government level, consumer rights people are paying attention to it as well. Great. Nick, how about you? Yeah, I... I think that um, this is a really great question. So I, I think that it really hits back on um, you know why students are re-enrolling, and that it's important that we not only understand that as administrators and as programs that serve these students, but that we also impart the understanding of adult learners and their motivations and uh, how adult learners operate in the classroom with faculty who are going to be with these students. So it's really an institution-wide initiative, and it can't just be siloed in these little programs that serve adult learners. Excellent point. Patty, you get the last word. What's your piece of advice? So my advice is be bold and be willing to take a risk on these students because they are so worth it. 
And um, it's a lot of work. It's a, a lot of extra work to provide the wraparound services, the personal outreach. But um, again, I will say the students are worth it. And, um, and don't let anyone try to uh, deter you from staying the course in helping these students. Fabulous. Be bold. I like that. Be bold and love them to success. Um, so unfortunately, we are out of time uh, for this discussion. So I'd like to first thank the National Student Clearinghouse for this fabulous report and for all of these data that you've provided. I'd also like to thank these three panelists for sharing your experience, your expertise, your words of wisdom. Um, it's, it's really fabulous. And for all of you watching, I hope you'll read the report. Go look at the interactive data on student progression for the nation, and you can actually go and look at your state, and you can disaggregate the data by race, ethnicity, age, and look at the pathways of the students as they re-enter, um, the some college no credential students as they re-enter. Um, I hope you learned a new idea from today's conversation or sparked a new question that we can, we can start to grapple with and continue to focus on this population. We've got to find solutions to change the trajectory for these 39 million individuals. It makes me nervous uh, with COVID and we know where enrollment went with COVID and I, I don't want to see you all in two years and, and have this number be in the 40s and I fear that it, that it might. So this is an emergency, urgent. We really need to focus on these people. As Patty said, they're worth it. Um, it's too important for these individuals their families, our communities, and for our nation uh, to ignore them any longer. So with that, thank you on behalf of uh, myself and the Clearinghouse and, and um, all of us. I hope you will go take action and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you all. Bye-bye.